Uh, we are now going to have an event on uh, social integration and placemaking infrastructures of belonging. And um, I'm very pleased to invite Sally Nishu, who will be chairing and moderating uh, this workshop. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Uh, welcome on board, everybody this interdisciplinary research forum event this evening with the title Infrastructures of Belonging in the City, Social Integration, Cultural Creative Ecosystems and Community Engagement. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a really interesting lineup of speakers uh, at st starting shortly. Just some housekeeping before we start. Um, we have quite a lot of people still joining us. Hopefully we'll be up to full capacity shortly. Um, the, you'll be able to make comments and ask, ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side. Um, and then we will also take those questions and comments by the end. At the end, we'll go through all of the speakers first, then we'll go into the question and answer session. We have all our speakers on board. Welcome, James. Well, you, you've jumped in there. That's good. We can see you. So we've got everybody on board now. We're going to have five different presentations in the first hour or so. Um, the first is going to be from James Parkinson who's Senior Programme Manager for Regeneration and Economic Development at the Greater London Authority. And James is going to speak um, to present some of the priorities that the GLA have around social integration as a kind of scene setting presentation for us as we go into slightly more detailed presentations after that. Um, and joining uh, James is Nicola Bacon, who's the founder of Social Life. Uh, Nicola has been doing some work with the GLA on connective social infrastructure, um, about the relationships between people and places. So Nicola is going to also add to what James's um, introduction to talk about that. <clears throat> then we're going to go into slightly longer presentations, 15 minutes each from several of the colleagues from London Met. First of all, we're going to have Professor Louise Ryan, who's the Director of Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre at London Met. And she's going to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, a specific research project looking at um, aging migrants and how ethnicity intersects with experiences of growing older in very specific places in, in London, which will be really interesting, um, about embodied encounters in those London places over time and, and with an ageing perspective. Then we're going to hear from um, Dr. Beatrice de Carly, who's going to talk about mapping community networks and some research that's going on again in three neighbourhoods in London, hyper diverse neighbourhoods, one in uh, two in London and one in Nottingham, to look at um, to give us some some stories and methodology around networks of and how to map stakeholder networks. Um, then we're going to hear from um, Professor Diana Stirbu and Ricardo Pereira Cavallo. <laughs> who've been doing a lot of work on community engagement related to London regeneration um, and have worked previously on the Social Integration Design Lab, <clears throat> which was commissioned by the Greater London Authority, and following on from that, a learning network that was uh, held amongst regeneration professionals of London authorities. And, and I think Diana and Ricardo will also touch about how this connects to the London Recovery Plan and the importance of engagement and participation. So really interesting lineup that will take us through about an hour of content now. Then we'll go into questions to the panel from you and, and from a, a, a sort of a multilateral information exchange. So I hope that sets the scene pretty well. I'm going to now hand over to James. James, I don't know if you want to share your screen already, if you can. Um, and we'll ask James to launch into his presentation to sort of set the scene on behalf of the Greater London Authority. Over to you, James. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for um, having us here. Um, can you see the slides, hopefully? We can, Perfect. thank you. OK, I'll crack on and I'll be quite brief and do a bit of an overview because um, it looks like we're going to have some really interesting presentations later about some of this work in a lot more detail. Um, so I am um, I, I'm a senior manager in regeneration, actually, um, but have done a fair bit of work with our social integration colleagues. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really kind of their policy agenda. Um, but it's been a really interesting um, kind of journey for us to embed that social policy within our regeneration thinking in the way that we do kind of capital delivery and work with partners on the ground. So um, the, the mayor's strategy for um, kind of social integration was published in 2018 and and when we talk about social integration in in essence we mean how we all live together um, and the mayor's vision um, is about shaping a city in which people have more opportunities to connect with each other positively and meaningfully 
um, it means supporting Londoners to play an active part in their community um, and the decisions that affect them. And fundamentally, it requires a focus on reducing barriers and inequalities so that Londoners can relate to each other as equals. Uh, and this strategy is, is available to read and it's called All of Us. Um, and, and some of the stuff that kind of came out of this really kind of set the tone for what a socially integrated London could or should be. Um, and that was a, a more equal city where differences are recognised and, and respected uh, and everyone can live their lives free from discrimination. Uh, everyone knows their rights will be protected um, and has what they need to succeed in life. So that, that kind of equality pillar. Um, a city where everyone plays an active role in their community and the decisions that affect them is really about participation and 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 how much people can kind of control what's going on around them. And it you know, kind of folds into big issues around democracy and where democracy is going. Um, and a city where we all kind of lead connected lives and build, have the opportunities to build kind of interesting and meaningful relationships, despite being perhaps from different backgrounds and, and that kind of relationship pillar um, being a really interesting one in the regeneration perspective. How do you kind of bring different parts of the community together uh, when places are going through kind of fundamental change and, and that change is going to be very difficult to either stop or pause, but how do you actually kind of bring new community together with an existing community and, and how does that work in harmony? Um, so this was these were kind of issues we've, we've been grappling with in regeneration for quite a long time, but London's neighbourhoods and, and high streets and businesses and and public spaces and, and places of worship and other bits and pieces of social infrastructure are all really kind of about bringing people together um, and, and providing this kind of stage for public life, I suppose. And I said it before, but, you know, if you get this stuff right, um, you can strengthen society, you can strengthen democracy. If you get it wrong, I think it has exactly the opposite effect. And you can see that playing out in you know, different contexts around the world. Um, I think the pandemic also really shone a light on how um, the kind of space around us and the built environment um, either enables or creates barriers to to kind of local resilience and the way that you might form um, those kind of support networks or relationships that, that are important or the way that you might access services and, and um, uh, the kinds of things that make life either easy or difficult. Um, and we kind of really noticed that quite quite significantly. And I'll say something about that in a second. Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of bits of work that we did with the social integration uh, team, and we're going to talk about them in, in a lot more detail of the course of this evening. But um, one was one was about being quite practical, and that was the social integration design lab and learning network. And that was really about bringing together kind of cross departmental cohorts of local authorities to test and share kind of innovation in this space. What does it actually mean to embed social integration practice in the delivery of either capital projects or, or local authority services? And how do we kind of um, surface and share that innovation and scale it and think about it um, collectively? Um, the other was um, more about the kind of research policy aspect of this. Um, and again, we'll talk a bit more about the Connective Social Infrastructure Report, but how do we understand what social infrastructure is in the planning context and move away from um, you know, quite a, a one dimensional definition of social infrastructure and start to embrace some new ideas um, that really talk about how we function as, as kind of communities uh, and what it actually takes to, to be successful at, at, at building social infrastructures. Um, and we've been kind of looking at this through a high street lens um, most recently, not least because high streets kind of make up the, the kind of fundamental foundation of, of communities in London, um, but also that it was one of our kind of key recovery missions during the pandemic. How do we support both business and community on high streets when we're going through these kind of um, really difficult periods of, of lockdown and, and reopening and, and um, you know, lots of people's lives been affected by things that were very much out of our control and very unknown. Um, and we suspected that some of the the kind of ideas of, of social integration and what makes a kind of socially integrated place would also translate into what makes a resilient place when you put those kind of places under pressure. And that's really how it played out when you look at the data in in the, um, the kind of pandemic and the difference we had between the, the various lockdown periods. 
the least resilient parts of London were the kind of central activity zone um, areas that were reliant on things like tourism and um, you know office workers and kind of big kind of commercial sector um, employment um, but also you know that kind of extends to places like Camden uh, the places that were much more resilient uh, sorry and another another kind of dimension to the least resilient was was places that were uh, reliant on retail like Stratford or dominated by commercial property like Uxbridge um, the places that were most resilient were the local centres that people used every day to fulfil basic needs and they 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 kind of they went there because they had to go there they absolutely relied on these places um not just for kind of good services jobs but also kind of support um and they were further away from the centre of london they were much more kind of local much more mixed as a as a kind of economy or social condition and they um recovered quicker as the lockdown periods kind of progressed adapting faster um, and proved more resilient in the long run when we kind of came out of, of the worst of the pandemic, shall we say. Um, I'm just going to say one tiny little little word on where we're kind of going with some of this stuff. So so I work a lot on our kind of capital investment um, portfolio, but the social integration team have done quite a lot of work with some of our community engagement colleagues around how you might measure. Sorry, I've been clicking the wrong the wrong button here and I'm not showing you the slides, but they're not that interesting. Um, here you go. Um, so our colleagues have been um, looking at how you might measure some of this stuff and, and how we can kind of help people to do that. Um, and we've got a social integration measurement toolkit that's that's available on the, the London data store to explore and experiment with. Uh, and more recently, a piece of work looking at, at civic strength across London and how you might measure that. Um, and how that type of data set might combine with some of the stuff I'm a little bit more familiar with around kind of economic metrics, footfall, spend, things like that. So we really understand um, how places work and how um, you know resilient places might places are from a number of different dimensions. Um, I'll probably leave it at that, I think. And sorry, I wasn't pushing those slides on with the right button. Um, my mistake. Thanks a lot, James. That's, I mean, really good introduction for us. And I think it might be useful to share the links to the data store with these because these toolkits are, I think, really good. Um, and people might be interested to look at them and make use of them going forward. So uh, either today or in the follow up, we'll make sure we share links to resources like that so people can have a good look. That'd be a really good idea. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to now pan the floor over to Nicola, uh, founder of Social Life, to talk a bit more in a bit more detail about this connective social infrastructure idea that James just mentioned and that Nicola has worked on. So Nicola, over to you. If you can manage to share your screen, that would be great. Hi, thanks. Um, and thanks, James. That was a great introduction um, to what I'm going to talk about. So um, let's just see if I get this. Um, is that visible to everyone? It Should is. Yes. If you go into presentation mode, it would be great. Going to. Yeah, it's just changing. It's whirring. Um, they're lovely. OK, so um, thanks a lot. So I'm Nicola Bacon. I'm um, one of the founders of Social Life, which is a small um, agency which does research and gets involved in practical projects. And all of our projects, one way or another, are about the relationship between people and places. And we're called Social Life because what really makes the difference often in what makes a neighbourhood thrive and what makes a neighbourhood resilient is the local social life, the relationships between different people, how communities function, the detail of how communities function and how we all support each other. So I'm particularly going to talk about the work that James was speaking about, which was a commission um, from the Mayor of London um, just pre-pandemic um, and the brief was to carry out a research inquiry about the relationship between London's social infrastructure and social integration and we did with this with the architect's practice Hawkins Brown um, and this was a big piece of work that actually ended up spanning pre-pandemic and during the first lockdown so um, we got a lot of really useful insights about like how social infrastructure and social integration works, but how it supports the resilience of London and how it actually helps us all thrive. It was a complex project. Um, it was based on three area studies in Catford, Homerton and Surbiton, a lot of um, borough wide work, um, including surveys of borough planning officers, detailed case studies of social infrastructure providers. It's all there online and I'll share the link. Um, but really one of the things that was most 
I think challenging about the brief were the issues of definition and the issues about how do we explain what we mean by social infrastructure when we're thinking about support for people living um, in local neighbourhoods in London. And quite often, like our first issue really was that so many people from different backgrounds see social infrastructure very different and it's often differently and it's often a very um, sector specific view. So if you're a local government planner, you may think of social infrastructure as what comes out of the planning process and very much about um, buildings and parks and sort of things that are very tangible. If you're working in the third sector, you may think of it much more about community organisations, you might think about networks, you might think about things, a faith organiser, you might think about something more fluid. Um, if you're running a local WhatsApp group that supports um, your local community, if you're running a cafe where you have um, a really clear wish to kind of do something to help local people, then you also feel you're part of the supports for a local neighbourhood. So the definition we needed to come up with needed to be flexible enough to deal with this like big kind of variety of supports and facilities and places, um, but also something that we could actually understand and work with. So we started off by mapping the difference between formal and informal um, social infrastructure. So formal being schools, libraries, parks, informal being things like allotments, free cycle groups, book clubs. Um, and then we thought about soft and hard social infrastructure. So soft infrastructure being like online things or networks or meetings or um, chats at school gates and hard things being much more, again, the tangible. So a lot of this was about the things that we can kind of see and touch and like look at and go, that's a building, that's a space versus those things that are much more nuanced, um, but are really, really important when we start thinking about um, what it is that helps people survive in local neighbourhoods and helps people thrive. And the, the um, resident surveys we carried out, we sort of asked people quite open questions about where do you go to for support, where do you go to for help? And they came out with a huge range of organisations. And so we started thinking very much about the idea of the social infrastructure ecosystem. So that a social infrastructure ecosystem in an area brings together all these different supports and it's about the relationships, very clearly about the relationships um, between all these different things. It's about the relationship between the school and the uh, community organisation and um, the local funder and the parents group and the all those different things. Um, and each social infrastructure, each local, um, local ecosystem is absolutely specific to each neighbourhood. It's not a pattern that you can transpose. So in the three different areas we looked at, we saw really different patterns of what mattered and what was helping people. Um, in Surbiton, for example, where there are fewer local government um, formal institutions, like the role of local pubs and cafes was really, really important, and the role of local churches. Whereas in Catford, where there's more uh, public sector investment going in there, there were more kind of formal organisations. Um, so the ecosystem is, really crucial we think and we've used this a lot going to moving on from this piece of work and um, to just think about how we understand local areas and I think one thing that's really important in this when we think about social integration is that thinking about like who benefits from these different sort of forms of provision and some services are open to everybody so a library is a universal service a school is a universal service some um, supports are very targeted they're for particular groups either explicitly or they become for particular groups because of the way they're used for example a cafe that becomes used by a particular form of the community and so we needed with to see like how different forms of provision and how different patterns of use are complementary and how they come together so we mapped what we found in the different areas so Surbiton's a really interesting example um, and so you see here you have little um, the circles sort of show where we found like really important kind of nodes of social infrastructure with the solid circles being the formal infrastructure um, and the empty rings being the informal infrastructure and you can see that kind of pattern of rings around the high street where we have these sort of shops and cafes and, and um, places that people go to to socialize and we asked people where they were going where they went if they wanted to um, meet or get support from people who were like themselves and we asked them where they went when they um, where they ended up spending time with people who were a bit different from them or from different backgrounds. And what came out very clearly was the formal social infrastructure, um, the libraries, the community centre, the GP, is a place where you are much more likely to spend time with people who are different from you. Um, and that could be because you're sitting in a waiting room, but it could be because you're part of a patient's group or you're part of a book club at a library or you're taking part in some sort of activity. Um, 
and the informal social infrastructure, the barbers, the cafes, all those things are much more likely to be places where you go to spend time with people who you think you know already or you think are like you. So your family, your friends, sort of like your own social group. And both of these supports are really important. Um, one is not more important than the other. Um, but you see very clearly. So when we looked at Homerton, you could see very clearly the role of all the different cafes. Um, on Well Street in supporting different parts of the community. There are some cafes that very much work for kind of people newer to the area, and there are some cafes that supported and like served food and drinks to people who'd been living there for a long time. And they together they formed this sort of ecosystem, this network of support. So what happened after March 2020? So you know we were I think we'd finished our field work. We were in the middle of thinking about analysing it and suddenly we had the first lockdown. Um, and, you know, thanks to GLA and James's team, we had some extra um, resources to go back and talk to the people we'd spoken to in the earlier stages to ask, really to look at what was happening um, and how they were responding. And we saw this great, you know, this huge flurry of support and local aid. And we saw particularly how the informal organizations, the informal networks really sprung into action very, very quickly. Um, and in some ways it was almost like the more informal than the organization, the faster it could move. Um, so the local mutual aid groups that kind of appeared overnight, um, a lot of community organizations that were very that were flexible and had very good local relationships very quickly set up food support. Um, and so those relationships and those networks and the importance of the informal just come, couldn't really be understated. So we found examples like there was a barber in Catford that set up an informal food bank. Uh, in Woolworth, we saw all sorts of food businesses getting involved in with Pembroke House and their food distribution. Um, and so it really kind of brought this idea of the social infrastructure ecosystem to the fore. Um, but then we saw how when after this kind of initial energy, that's when councils, when the public sector, when um, the bigger, slightly slower moving organisations really moved in to support that flexible um, support. So there was a really interesting example of how the third sector and grassroots organisations work with the state and the sort of relative um, strengths of each one. And this is just an example of what happens in Homerton. So food was critical to local responses all over London. Um, and what we could see when we looked at Homerton, we asked about what relationships um, had been strengthened um, and what relationships were new and what existed already. And we could see, so this is like a sort of rough like ecosystem of food support in Homerton. So we could see that um, external charitable organisations, the Felix Project, um, Children with Voices came in very much as new organisations, but there are also new relationships between community halls, um, between um, this sort of the purple group of the kind of very informal groups. Um, and so that system shifted really quickly. And that was the network that we mapped in, I think, June. So that was after three months of the pandemic. So you could see this just extraordinary flexibility there. Um, and just sort of thinking, as I say, we use this, we've used this sort of approach a lot more, more widely just in our general work. So Social Life has done a lot of work about different regeneration schemes and what happens when the built environment changes and what happens to people's sense of belonging and what happens to their local supports. Um, so we've recently completed some work on the Aylesbury Estate, which is a um, big, um, well-known regeneration scheme, which has been going very slowly and has put quite a lot of um, stress on local communities. There's been a lot of population churn and a lot of change um, over the last five, ten years. And this is just a map of what happened um, to social infrastructure between 2021 and the last time we did some work on the Aylesbury, which I think was 2017. Um, and what you can see is this sort of um, the purple and the orange um, blobs on here are things that were either relocated or um, things that are shut or things that are due to due to close. And most of this provision will be replaced by um, the regeneration. It's not that things are going ultimately, but there is a lot of change here at the same time as a community is going through a lot of change, a lot of demographic change and a lot of physical change with demolition and rebuilding. And the things that have stayed, the blue blobs, are all informal social, mostly informal social infrastructure, their shops, um, their takeaways, their um, some very small voluntary organisations. 
um, generally, and there are a few new organisations um, like Pembroke House is open, Woolworth Living Room. Um, but what this really shows is the importance of some of this sort of less formal social infrastructure and in supporting places as they go through change. So it's not just something that's a nice to have or something that kind of comes to the fore in the pandemic. There are actually these sort of informal resources are really, really important for us all um, when just in dealing with kind of difficult times. And I think as, you know, places like as London, as London's neighbourhoods go through the coming winter with cost of living crisis and all the sort of huge pressures on communities, I think we need to value this social infrastructure ecosystem very strongly um, and make sure that when we go through change and regeneration, we don't sort of inadvertently destroy things that are really essential to support communities. So that's me. Thanks, Nicola. Really interesting. Um, there's, I love the mapping on that, and it helps us to understand really well. For me, I think that whole that the the axis between informal, formal, hard, and soft is a really interesting way of thinking about this. And things like park runs and and uh, free cycle clubs that mm -hmm. maybe we wouldn't have thought of before are really good ones to to open your mind to what this informal ecosystem can can be and look like and I think um, the, this idea that the formal ones maybe where people who are different meet and the informal ones are more maybe within communities is also quite interesting to think about and that it's not static that it changes over time but you can map it over time like your last slide showed and I think Beatrice will talk a bit about um, uh, issues connected to the Aylesbury, Aylesbury estate because she's mm -hmm. going to talk about Latin elephants so we're going to have a, a connection to that through a, a different research project here different same mm -hmm. part of London but maybe a different lens so thanks so much for that please do put comments and questions in the chat as we go because I'm uh, if, if you're anything like me there's lots of ideas coming to mind or, or questions of how this could work and especially how local authorities work with this kind of e ecosystem as well I think in terms of uh, the, the interface as you said between the third sector and government so thanks for that. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who's Professor Louise Ryan. Louise, hi. You, you've, uh, if you could start sharing your screen, that would be great. I'm going to hand over to you to tell us about your research project on diversity of ageing migrants. Um, very interesting uh, from Kilburn and other places in London. So thanks a lot. Over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, can you see my screen OK? We can. Yes, great. And I was really enthralled there listening to a conversation about Surbiton, because for me, Surbiton will always be the home of the good life. Uh, for those of you of a certain age, you'll know the television drama I'm talking about, which was famously set in Surbiton. But we're moving now from deep south London to north London, to Kilburn and places in that area. And this presentation, which is Kilburn, is not Kilburn anymore, an analysis of ageing in and out of place. Uh, the article has been published uh, in 2021 in the journal Population, Space and Place. It's open access, so anybody can download and read the article if you're interested. So in the time today, I'm just going to give you a very short summary and overview of the key themes. But if you want the, the rich detail, then please do download the article. So in a context of an ageing society, of course, there's increasing attention on how people navigate and make sense of particular places through the ageing process. With increasing frailty in advanced old age, navigating even places that were once very familiar may become challenging. Ageing coupled with other life events such as bereavement and diminishing support networks may impact on people's sense of belonging in local places. Of course, places themselves are constructed and dynamic and they are continually made and remade over time, including by, of course, uh, waves of migration. So as well as older people perceiving particular kinds of changes in places, these places themselves as material entities, of course, are also dynamic, which impacts on long-term residents, including older migrants. So for migrants, ageing, of course, may result in additional challenges. Ageing in itself can be um, a shared experience for all of us if we're lucky enough. Uh, but for migrants, there, there may be some specificities as well. For those who arrived in Britain to work, ageing and retirement may raise particular questions about return back to the origin country. But of course, return is not necessarily easy as home places themselves are also dynamic and changing over time so that migrants may no longer feel a sense of belonging, even in those uh, so-called home 
places, which can result in a feeling of being out of place. Now, as the older generation back home die off, migrants' closest relatives, including their children and their grandchildren, may now be in the destination society, creating significant ties to those particular places. So that sort of shifting sense of home over time. Now, beyond the considerable body of academic research, which has been done on so-called retirement migration, there is limited, though increasing, research on how migrant populations navigate ageing in the destination societies. Nonetheless, the ways in which migrants connect and identify with particular places is still not well understood, especially in the context of advanced old age. Moreover, there have been calls for more research on the diversity of ageing migrants, and how ethnicity can intersect with experiences of growing older in particular places, and of course intersects with gender, religion, sexuality, ability, disability, and of course class being crucial, and I'll come back and say more about class in a minute. So in the paper and in the research project, we're adopting a spatial lens, focusing its attention on the particular characteristics of specific places, including the local neighbourhoods where the migrants live. We do acknowledge, of course, that in adopting a spatial lens, this is a multidimensional spatial lens, and we can't ignore the national context. Now, I should say, in the paper, we talk quite a lot about the national context. We talk particularly about Brexit, a favourite topic of mine, and the Windrush scandal which were very important backdrops to the research that we did. But in today's presentation, I'm just going to look at the local context. So before any of you point out that I'm missing the national context, it's definitely in the paper. And so what we're talking about is how everyday lived experiences are lived through the local and the intimate spaces of the city, the home, the neighbourhood, the market, the park, a range of institutional spaces, and through embodied experiences of difference, as Phillips and Robinson have described it. Now, in the paper, we use a concept of embedding, and it's interesting that we started off this evening's presentations talking about integration, but we use a, a softer concept, a more kind of experiential concept of embedding, which is something that uh, John Mulholland and I have been writing about now for the last um, seven or eight years, as a way of capturing complex dynamic and multidimensional processes of belonging and attachment over time. This is originally inspired by the work of the sociologist Mark Granovator. He wrote about the concept of embeddedness, but we considered embeddedness to imply something which is quite static, an achieved state like now I am embedded. Instead, we draw on Bourdieu's notion of effort and highlight that attachments and belonging can never be assumed, can never be taken for granted, but require continual ongoing work, time, energy, commitment and effort. Therefore, to capture that dynamism over time, we prefer to use the verb embedding uh, to capture these dynamic processes rather than embeddedness. So if you're interested in this kind of conceptual stuff, there's lots more about that in the paper. And developing further on from embedding, we talk about the notion of differentiated embedding. And what that concept tries to understand and unpick is the multidimensionality of embedding across different places and different relationships. So we argue, for example, that migrants may have different attachments to people and places here and there, and how these can change over time through the life course. The notion of differentiated embedding points to different depths or degrees of attachment and belonging that migrants may experience and negotiate across those different dimensions of their lives and different scales, both in terms of the dwelling place, the local neighbourhood, the town, the city, but also the nation state and, of course, transnationally back in the place of origin. Moreover, in using a notion which captures dynamism, we also argue that embedding can be reversed, and so this can result in a sense of disembedding over time. And in the paper, we talk about Brexit and the Windrush scandal, 
as examples of uh, processes that can provoke a sense of this embedding of no longer belonging of no longer being accepted and fitting in even in places where you may have lived for 50 or 60 years just to say something very briefly about the study it was funded by the economic and social research council it was a large grant uh, that was run by the university of sheffield where i used to work uh, entitled the sustainable care program from 2017 to 21 in our work package, we had this qualitative study with 47 participants. They were um, aged between their 70s and their 90s, but the average age was 81. And they were from originally Caribbean, Ireland and Poland. Most of the participants in our study had lived in their particular neighbourhoods for many, many decades. So interestingly enough, although they were migrants, they were often the long term residents in those areas. So, for example, Miriam, who was 79, an Irish widow, had lived in Cricklewood for over 50 years, and she really thought of Cricklewood as being home. Now, in terms of how people negotiated their local neighbourhoods, especially as they entered uh, their 80s and 90s, uh, the importance of adopting this multiscalar approach was very important. Aging can change how one experiences and negotiates these particular places, requiring this ongoing process of embedding over time. Most participants described how their circumstances had changed, so their embodied experiences as they got older. And this was often articulated in terms of lack of mobility and associated lack of independence. So, for example, Maney, who was relatively young at 72, but nonetheless, she had quite severe mobility issues. She talked about no longer being able to walk to the bus stop and how her mobility was seriously reduced as a result of her physical condition. And she made this very pertinent observation. She said, my 60s were great years, but now as she entered her 70s, she was encountering more problems. And I'd like to emphasize this because I think sometimes in the literature, there's a tendency to lump all older people together into one big category. And what we found is that there are very significant differences between people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and then entering into their 90s. So it's really important that we differentiate across that huge group of post-retirement people. Public transport emerged unsurprisingly as a very significant theme in how people negotiate their local neighbourhoods and their sense of um, being able to navigate those spaces. So we interviewed this married couple. Uh, yes, she was 89 and he was 78 and she did refer to him as her toy boy. And they lived in an area of North London in Tottenham, where again they'd lived for 50 or I think almost 60 years. And they talked about the importance of public transport. And interestingly, Matthew said that where they lived, there were 13 different bus routes. I've never counted how many bus routes I have access to here in South London, but he knew there were 13 buses. But the availability of public transport doesn't necessarily mean that it can be easily utilised by people. Matthew, for example, was registered blind and he talked about the difficulties he had in using the available public transport because of his disability. Loneliness was a very important factor and people talked very much about shrinking social networks. This was often associated with bereavement, but also with reduced mobility and declining health, no longer being able to go out and about and socialise with people. Phyllis, who was 86 and originally from the Caribbean, lived alone in South London. I interviewed her in her flat. She had a lovely basement flat with a nice garden, but there were a lot of steps to get out of her flat and she now found it really difficult to negotiate and her lovely flat had, begin, had begun to become a trap for her exacerbating her loneliness and isolation. People talked a lot about the importance of getting out and about and how their four walls could begin to feel like a trap. Kathleen, who at 90 was one of our oldest, though not the oldest participant, and we interviewed her in her a flat in Kilburn. It was a lovely flat, really nice flat, but it was on the fourth floor of a tower block. And when we went to interview her, she described to us how the lift had been out of order the previous weekend and she had not been able to leave the flat because she couldn't manage the stairs and the lift wasn't functioning. So she was 
physically trapped in that space. Yolanda, who was originally from Jamaica, also talked about the importance of getting out and about. And she had this lovely quote where she described her ideal day as getting up in the morning, putting on her clothes, going out the front door and being out all day and not coming back until the evening. A key theme that emerged was becoming unfamiliar in what had been familiar places. And this was about the dynamism of these areas. And these were often areas that were undergoing regeneration. So, for example, we had a couple from Poland, Elvira and her husband, Jakob, and they owned a house in a lovely, quiet street in South London, in a very nice area of South London. And we did walking interviews as part of our research. And during the walking interview, Elvira described to us as we walked around how her neighbourhood had changed dramatically over the 30 or 40 years since she had moved in. This was a transformation in both socioeconomic and generational, as the area now attracted a large inflow of young affluent families. And walking around, you could really see all the facilities that were catering for children and young families. And Elvira and Jakob, uh, Jakob was, was in his 90s, uh, they now felt that they no longer belonged in this neighbourhood. There was really nothing catering for their needs in that neighbourhood. However, interestingly enough, another Polish woman, Jadwiga, who lived in the same neighbourhood, when we interviewed her, she was very positive about the regeneration of the neighbourhood. She said when she had first moved in there, it wasn't really safe to walk around at night as a woman, uh, but now the area had become gentrified and her house was worth a fortune, uh, which she was obviously very happy about. Several participants remarked on processes of transformation that changed the ethnic identity of their neighbourhoods. For example, Barry, who was our oldest participant at 92, had lived in Kilburn, sorry, not in Kilburn, in Cricklewood uh, for, I think, about 60 years. He owned a house in Cricklewood and he really described how the ethnic composition of Cricklewood had changed very dramatically. The areas of Kilburn and Cricklewood would have been known historically as very Irish areas of London. Kilburn was often referred to as the 33rd County of Ireland, sometimes referred to as County Kilburn to reflect the high numbers of Irish people. But that is no longer the case. And for older Irish people like Barry, but also for Kathleen, these areas no longer felt like that kind of familiar Irish neighbourhood that it used to. And this is where the title of the paper comes from when Kathleen said Kilburn is not Kilburn anymore. So just to conclude briefly, in the paper, what we try to do is to contribute to understanding the embodied and emplaced experiences of ageing migrants. We adopt a multi-scalar approach. We do look at wider political level, though I haven't mentioned that tonight, but we specifically also focus on local neighbourhood experiences, those day-to-day -day encounters and navigations of space. Evidence from our research indicates that the life histories and experiences of ageing involve ongoing processes of embedding but also potentially disembedding across various scales, including nationally, locally, and indeed transnationally. And so we try to contribute to understanding older migrants as active agents in placemaking, but also paying attention to those changing materialities of places, both here and there through time. So thank you very much for your attention. As I mentioned, the paper is published and uh, you can, um, Thanks. Sorry, I think I'm still sharing my screen. I'm just going to try and stop sharing. Okay. Thank, so thanks, thank you Louise. for your thank attention. Thank you. Thanks so much for that presentation, Louise. And I hope you're staying on board. To it. I think there'll be some questions about that. Certainly, I have some for you afterwards. But um, I think that the concept of embodying is new to me, maybe to other people on board, and quite an interesting one to start thinking about, and the difference between that and into social integration, how we how we think about those differently. I, I'd, I'd love to read your paper to find out more. Um, I really liked I really liked the first person testimonials in your research, this sort of lived experience that really brings to life how how it feels to be part of those populations in changing neighborhoods and uh, losing your independence or, or mobility. 
Um, and I also wonder how the, the the social infrastructure maps against this generationally. That would be quite interesting to link things like the social life work with with the, your work to see what what is available to these older people and what, what what are the infrastructures that they depend on or that could be created for them to support their lives. But thank you so much for that. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have some questions. Um, I'm going to move on now to uh, Dr. Beatrice Hi, Beatrice. If you want to start, Beatrice, if you want to start, start sharing, sharing. No. Yes. your, your um, Screen, screen, and I'll hand, and I'll hand over to you. Great. Can you see the screen now? We can, we can. Yes, great. So good evening to everyone, and thank you to the presenters who just concluded. It was really fascinating. And today I will be presenting a, 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 a so the piece of work titled Mapping Community Networks. And although I will be uh, the voice of this presentation, uh, this is research that has been developed collaboratively with Luis Ryan, who just presented, as well as with Alessio D'Angelo, Elena Genov, and with Patterson from the University of Nottingham, and uh, Hosnon Sami and Sally Alon, who's, who have been um, their research assistants on the project and who have played a really important role uh, also in its development. And some of my colleagues, are, uh, as well as Luis, are, are here present in uh, this evening in the event, so then they will also be able to contribute to the discussion later on. So uh, the project itself, Mapping Community Networks, is a, is a quite small pilot project that we carried out between April and September this year, and, and part of it is still ongoing and developing into a new uh, research initiative. And the aim of this project was really to uh, to reflect on a question of, uh, of how and of methodology. So what we wanted to do with this project was to develop an interdisciplinary methodology that, that would allow us to conduct participatory network analysis in, in urban areas. And we have been thinking about this methodology as a way of making visible and, and perhaps making actionable the uh, what we are referring to this evening as well as the social infrastructure of places so we have been coming together from quite different disciplinary backgrounds ranging from architecture to um, sort of uh, migration studies and social policy to look at how we might bring these different perspectives together in developing a, uh, a way of looking at uh, what tonight we defined as uh, sort of this topic of investigating the links between the built environment and, and social integration and, and social relations at large. Um, so it is in the presentation today, although I will be referring to particular places, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, I will be referring back to a few neighborhoods, but particularly organizations in London, uh, most of the focus of the uh, of the talk will be on, on issues around methods and, and the way we've been developing this. So then why is it relevant then in, uh, to ask this question? We developed this methodology because we have been particularly interested in, in trying to understand how uh, social relations and social infrastructure can support the well-being and, and inclusion of diverse communities of residents in urban neighborhoods. And this in turn, uh, we hope, can inform processes of local mobilization, of participatory planning and local policy making. And we've been interested in, in, in interrogating this issue and methods, particularly in relation to contexts that are undergoing change, uh, such as uh, processes of urban regeneration, which is something that Nicola as well was talking to earlier. And we've been interested in looking at how shifting demographics or increased environmental or economic pressures uh, are affecting uh, networks. And this uh, also speaks to, as I, I, I was mentioning, quite different uh, disciplinary areas and, and debates. So on, on the one hand, um, there have been conversations around the social value of the built environment uh, developing within the, the field of architecture and urban studies. Uh, but on the other, we were also talking to uh, research around social networks, which is, uh, has really been Louise and Alessio's specialism, and they can talk to this in more detail later. Um, and at the same time, 
we find that this uh, this piece of work and then so to this approach may also support conversations, uh, for instance, around ideas of community-led development and, and ideas of urban commons and commoning and how we understand the, um, the processes of communities and networks of organizations coming together to transform their built environment. And, and obviously we are uh, talking in, in thinking about this, this work, uh, we are also thinking about how this might have uh, my engage in dialogue with policy and with research such as the um, the connected social infrastructure report that we've been hearing about and how uh, sort of this piece of academic research may engage uh, directly um, with that. Um, so coming to the pilot study itself, the, the study included three key academic partners, so the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre and the Centre for Urban and Built Ecologies, which are both uh, based at London Met, and we were working at the University of Nottingham with the International Centre for Public and Social Policy. And the, the study itself developed between April and, and September, as I mentioned, part of the analysis is still ongoing. So what I will be presenting as well is, uh, is a, to a large extent, uh, a, a work in progress. And within this, this period, uh, and then actually in uh, between May and July, uh, the, the, as part of the project, we conducted three half-day collaborative workshops uh, with different partners. And each workshop was then sort of embedded within a larger process of preparation and follow up uh, with the local partners. So the partner organizations themselves were the Brixton Project, Latin Elephant and Transforming Not uh, Together. So the Brixton Project, as uh, some of you are familiar with it, is a cultural organization that is based in Brixton and has been focusing on um, participatory placemaking as they define it. Uh, and the organization itself has been focusing on creating and curating uh, places and, and, and spaces where uh, people who might come from different backgrounds and, and sort of different life trajectories and experiences can all have an investment. The Latin Elephant, again, uh, many of you may be familiar with it, is a, uh, is a charity that uh, emerged um, during the process or sort of partly also in reaction to the process of regeneration that has been going on uh, in Elephant and Castle in London. And as a charity, they promote uh, alternative and innovative ways of engaging uh, migrant and ethnic groups in processes of urban change. This, again, is how they, they self-define the organization. And finally, in Nottingham, we were working with uh, Transforming Nottingham Together, which is uh, uh, which is part of the of Nottingham Citizens, uh, which again, for those of you who are familiar with Citizens UK, is is also part of the Burden Network. Uh, so, it, and it's an organisation that is uh, linking together. Uh, churches primarily across uh, Nottingham and the Burden region, and to uh, keep and connect them. To, uh, to support their local communities. And within this group, we were particularly working with the, um, with the network, uh, within TNT, who was working on, uh, on migration and, and asylum. So as a methodolo methodological approach, what we did through the study was to focus on, on developing uh, a few co-design tools that could then link and combine say, quite distinct uh, research approaches. So on the one hand, we were, uh, as I mentioned, bringing the perspective of social network analysis, which examines patterns of relations between people or between organizations. Uh, we were uh, bringing in also a, an aspect of spatial mapping, so looking at the role of space and, and the special organization of relationships uh, as a way of understanding how uh, networks might be coming together uh, in place. And then there was a very important component that we started testing with this pilot project around participatory action research that was looking at how this, this type of analysis could be conducted in a collaborative way with the organizations that we were uh, observing and, and working with. Uh, but also as a paradigm participatory action research means looking at how the research might be or oriented towards action and towards uh, sort of reflection and, and strategy making, especially for the uh, for the partners and the organizations that are involved. 
In practice, this meant, uh, has meant that we developed a number of co-design tools. What you're seeing now on the screen are, are sort of large boards that we were using during the workshops. Uh, and then we conducted a, a series of uh, sort of um, participatory discussions and focus group discussions uh, using visual um, the, the boards and a number of visual aids to facilitate the conversation. And the, the aim to through the use of these different tools and, and the combination of these different approaches was to experiment with bringing together ideas of uh, uh, sort of an analysis of the stakeholders that are involved in a particular context and, and an analysis of the relationships between those stakeholders with an understanding of how these relationships are grounded in place. There are some precedents to this and, and you're seeing uh, one of them here and obviously uh, we were hearing earlier about the, the work of social life that has also been uh, very influential, at least uh, uh, for me personally. But but there, this is not a field that has been developed in in detail in terms of bringing together. Uh, I think that that uh, social sciences perspective as well that uh, that comes with networks analysis uh, with the uh, urbanism and urban planning background. So what we did in practice was to conduct this, uh, the three workshops that I mentioned. The first one was uh, run with Latin elephant. Uh, the second one with the Brixton project, and then the final one with transforming Nottingham together. And each of the workshops took place in a in a location that was uh, relevant to the organization that we were uh, working with. So they they selected the place, and we were always on site within the context. Uh, that we were uh, talking about. The participants do change quite radically from uh, workshop to workshop. So in, in each of the cases, we agreed with our partners that they would, um, so the, they played a really important role in defining who would participate uh, each time and in each of these conversations. So in the, uh, in the case of Latin Elephant, we worked uh, first with the Latin Elephant staff and their volunteers, and then with some of the traders that are part of their local network, and, and they are the, um, some of the constituencies that they've been advocating for uh, in the process of regeneration at Elephant and Castle. Then at the Brixton project, again, we work with staff uh, from, from the organization itself and with the um, sort of uh, loser network of residents and organizations based in Brixton that had a uh, different relationship with, the, uh, with our partner themselves. And then in, in Nottingham, uh, we had a much uh, sort of tighter group that we were working with. So we uh, the whole workshop was conducted with the Christian Action Network and particularly the Refugee Asylum Seekers and, uh, and Migration Network. That was a network of organizations that were already working together and, and sort of the, they were familiar with each other's work. In practice, how the data collection took place was through these uh, different workshops where there were three main focuses in the analysis. So in the, there was uh, in each workshop there was a, um, normally a first moment that was focusing on on their, the, our partner organization itself and understanding their uh, ecosystem of relationships. Uh, then there was a second moment when. Uh, the participants would come together and, and map out uh, their relationships to each other and to other organizations. And then a, a, a third moment that was looking at, uh, that actually was implemented in this form only in the third workshop. Uh, we had a third moment that was looking at uh, sort of connecting uh, some of the issues that we were mapping out in terms of relationships to uh, a, a spatial analysis. So to make an example in uh, what happened in this third workshop in Nottingham is that through the, the second moment of the uh, of the workshop, we identify a few key issues that had to do in particular with uh, housing and education and the provision of housing and uh, education services for uh, newly arrived migrants to the city. And we then mapped out uh, especially how uh, the organizations that were involved in the workshop had been providing the services or uh, and and how these are related to places where uh, where migrants lived. So then there was this this third component that we tested only in that moment. Then as part of the, the process, we systematized the data by using um, 
quite uh, common tools like Google Maps and uh, and a few online whiteboards to make sense again of these uh, large uh, large networks that were emerging from the the conversations, and then we've been developing. Um, and this is a, an initial outcomes of the analysis have been the development of a series of diagrams that are starting to capture these networks. So these diagrams are first looking at one particular partner organization and, and their own networks. And then uh, they might be looking at uh, sort of the, the broader collaborative network and uh, how this network is distributed in space. And in the, in the diagrams that I was just showing now, um, uh, apart from the, the first one, all of the organizations have been anonymized and I will go back to this point because it, it, it's been one of our key sort of methodological uh, challenges has also uh, been about how do we disseminate and how do we make this information available to others. So again, out of this uh, of this work, there were a few methodological reflections that started to emerge. And uh, again, I think that my colleagues will be able to also come in the conversation later to expand uh, on these points. So the, the very first um, consideration has been that the workshops were extremely diverse in terms of uh, their scope, in terms of participants, but also the focus and the type of issues that each organization was facing. And this has been uh, an obvious limit in, in the possibility to compare findings and uh, in terms of what did these workshops tell us uh, about social networks and, and, and place. But at the same time, they have been, it, it has been really useful to test the methodology in these different contexts because we, uh, we have been able to adapt and, and understand uh, what in that sort of process could or couldn't work. A second really important uh, and, and possibly one of the main uh, issues that we've been debating, I think, since the conclusion of the third workshop has been how do we um, define and, and sort of uh, how do we control what is the particip participants group within uh, within each of the workshops. And as I mentioned earlier, the participants to each of those uh, three events uh, were very, were quite wide ranging. And we went from the, maybe the two extremes of uh, uh, one of the workshops being um, publicly or partly publicly advertised and, and so having uh, we're in a, which created a situation where we had a lot less control on what was the uh, the participation to the conversation. So as you, you might imagine, mapping the network that was coming out of that conversation um, presented a lot of challenges, uh, as opposed to the final situation that we uh, developed in Nottingham, where uh, we had a lot of um, sort of the, the participants to the workshop themselves were part of a specific network of groups and churches and, and sort of support organizations that had been working together on the issue of um, sort of um, migrants uh, integration and, and inclusion. And so the, this issue around how do we define the participants participants group and and generally whose network are we mapping when we are looking at uh, at this network of uh, social relationships in places uh, was really key and and another point that also came out of the conversations and and the reflection has been the importance of building time for uh, reflection and analysis either within the workshops or in between each of these workshops has been quite attended by quite a large number of people and and it hasn't always been easy to build in moments when we could step back and and, and look at the the outcomes uh, and the type of network that was emerging and what that that was telling us um finally other uh, a few other reflections that came out in, in reference to the the method itself had to do with how we we process the data so we, there was a lot of there is a lot of um like quite a strong advantage in the use of visual methods and you've started seeing some of the maps and diagrams that we are producing out of that work but at the same time it's been uh, because again of the nature of the workshop it's been extremely challenging to go through the um the verbal data and, and sort of refer back uh, to all of the transcripts from the workshops. So there's something there that we are working on, on how we might uh, continue capturing both uh, in a way that is perhaps more, um, so to that, that makes it easier to analyze the information moving forward. 
um, further issues that to do with how we might, uh, how we need to contextualize the outcomes. Uh, so the the outputs themselves and and the the diagrams and the maps that you've been seeing are uh, representations of uh, of a particular narrative and and the perceptions of the stakeholders and, and the participants that were involved in the workshops. And again, uh, both Alessio and Luis will be able to talk to this uh, in further detail. But uh, it it is a key. Uh, like it is a very important observation for us when looking at these maps to uh, remind ourselves that those are uh, representing someone's view and someone's perception of how those relationships might work and, and uh, this doesn't mean that everyone else's perception of those connections may be the same. And finally, there's been a, a, another issue that I was mentioning earlier that has to do with the ethics of uh, of sharing and circulating uh, this data. Obviously, we've, we've been going through um, the sort of ethical procedures are, as, as are uh, normally carried out within the university, but also we've been going through a lot of conversations with our partners on what was the scope and the aim of each of the workshops. But at the same time, we find that right now it is a very important moment as well to go back uh, to, to our partners and, and co-produce uh, a dissemination strategy and uh, decide together what type of information can be circulated and, and to whom, because a lot of those reflections on how, for instance, a group might be in conflict with another or in tension uh, with another group or with the local authority are, are very delicate to handle, but they're also extremely important to uh, sort of acknowledge. So just as a way of concluding, then the what has been emerging from the study is a sort of uh, three step uh, methodology that does include these uh, different moments of, uh, but that we would like to develop further, uh, building in sort of more distinct moments of uh, of collaboration with each of the partners, uh, but also building in the methodology much further time for reflection and collaborative analysis of the outcomes as they uh, they come out from each, uh, each workshop or each set of workshops or engagements. And so there's, uh, as I briefly described earlier, there is a first moment that has been focusing on uh, somehow mapping people and connections, as, as we've been calling it, uh, which is centered on uh, a particular partner organization and, and has been aiming, or we hope it will aims to map out that organization's own network and understand who is it that they're collaborating with. And one of the key outcomes of this um, as we foresee it moving forward, is to agree on what is the guiding question for further workshops, but also what is the network that should be involved uh, in a second step of, of the methodology. The, the second step is uh, what has been uh, for the moment represented by the, the diagram you have in the middle, is looking at how we might um, so to map out a collaborative network together with the, that, that same network of organizations and how we can understand their relationships to others uh, as well and how they they collaborate with others. And then there's this, uh, a step that has to do with mapping the special dimensions of that collaboration and understanding how relationships take place uh, in space. I'm conscious I'm running over time a little bit. Yeah, this is the last, uh, the last slide. But we, we've been then been trying to um, reflect on how this methodology has um, sort of. Uh, um, benefits for different types of stakeholders, but maybe the, I, I'll just mention one thing on this uh, in this regard, which is the the value that the participant organizations have found uh, in in doing this type of work so far, uh, which has had to do with the uh, aspect of self-reflecting on how they are operating as part of a network, but also uh, and it's something that has been seen or the feedback we received has had to do with uh, how these workshops may allow for. Um, net, further networking and building strategies on on how to operate. Again, thank you for this. And sorry for going over time. It's the first time we present this work externally, and I'm still getting to grips with it. Thanks, BHC. I can hear, I can an, hear echo an echo. On my voice. Maybe I'll hand over to Diana. 
oh, actually, it's gone now. I think that's that's incredibly complex. <laughs> these co-production methods and the the thinking that you have, and I think it throws up a lot of questions for everybody as well. I think for you as well as for the audience about how this works and the fact that it's work in progress. Uh, but really interesting to ways of looking at, like you said, relationships grounded in place in three different places with three different groups and with three different tools. In fact, there's a, a, lot, a lot of threes there. But I think that was um, we might well have some questions about that um, from the audience and maybe your colleagues would want to come in during the panel session, too. But I'm going to now hand over to our final um, duo of speakers, which is Professor Diana Sirbu and Ricardo Pereira Carvalho, who are going to talk about um, Infrastructures of Collective Reimagination, Community Engagement in London's Regeneration. Over to you, Diana. Uh, thank you, Sally, um, and thank you to, to uh, all presenters for really interesting um, presentations. Can you all see my slides and hear me well? Actually, the slides don't, aren't in presentation mode, they're in speaker notes. Oh, sorry. Um, That's it. Um, so, thank you very much for, 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 for this, and uh, I think what we're trying to do today, uh, Ricardo and I, um, is to offer a double act, uh, if you want, that will illustrate to an extent the way um, we try to involve students um, in uh, our uh, research projects, research and knowledge exchange projects. Uh, this particular project that we are going to present today is um, uh, is part of a bigger piece of work uh, that sits under a program around uh, a research and knowledge exchange program around uh, social integration uh, at London Met. Um, so I think the the you know we've we've heard the definition of social integration um, and the three pillars: uh, relationships. Um, equality and participation and in this particular presentation in our project we focused um, on the participation uh, dimension uh, in particular and it also linked with uh, with this idea of uh, infrastructures of uh, imagination and this is not necessarily a new or novel idea from from us but we were inspired by the um, uh, by the National Lotteries uh, programme in 2020, that was called, I think, Emerging Futures. Uh, and in that particular piece of work, uh, you know, there was a recognition there was a, the, the, that we need to build capacity within uh, communities and a, uh, at collective level so that we can, um, uh, so we can imagine alternative futures. And I think because we are still, I think, at a point of inflection, um, uh, post uh, post COVID and still within kind of a crisis mode, I think these windows of opportunity to perhaps uh, push forward more radical uh, change um, uh, are, are quite important. Um, so uh, basically, uh, we we do base our work on uh, on our previous. Um, uh, work on social integration that Sally mentioned uh, earlier, the Social Integration Design Lab, the Social Integration and Regeneration Learning Network, um, where we work quite closely with local authorities across London. Um, and uh, I think one of the key lessons that we've learned from, from those uh, projects were um, around the importance of community engagement in regeneration. So, so these came as really the key to uh, being able to embed social integration principles within regeneration practice and policy, um, you know, that there, there ought to be a, um, a focus on community engagement. And of course, community engagement uh, and engagement as a principle is uh, underpinning um, uh, the nine recovery missions of the London Recovery Plan. So again, that was quite important for us. Um, and the Connective Social Infrastructure uh, report uh, and the work that Nicola has done um, was, was quite important for us because it really helped us redefine that social infrastructure, um, a challenge actually, the, the way we, uh, we used to define uh, social infrastructure. And it also brought to, um, uh, brought to, to lie this idea of uh, local ecosystems of decision making, and these are some of the things that we uh, we are using in uh, in our research. Um, of course, we uh, you know we 
the aim here is to advance a new uh, concept of collective uh, of infrastructures of collective reimagination. Uh, and we're drawing here on um, on two uh, on a series actually of um, of concepts uh, around community engagement, participatory governance, um, and par particip participatory governance um, yeah, is about creating those opportunities uh, to uh, for people to connect and participate in decision making. Um, it is about guaranteeing um, that uh, when decisions are made, uh, those who will be affected by those decisions are part of uh, of that process. Um, and I suppose the uh, participatory governance has become uh, a concept that is widely accepted uh, as really improving um, uh, effectiveness of, of decision making, but also improving accountability of, of decision making. Um, I think the starting point and the, the, the core assumption here is that citizens are seen as assets um, in complex uh, problem solving rather than being problematized or being seen as, um, as, as, a, as a problem, as an issue. Um, and we're drawing here on uh, Tina Nabatki um, uh, quote um, where she says that the power of ordinary people and the ability of governments, civil society and other institutions to unleash that capacity is the key to our progress as a civilization. Um, and of course, community engagement, uh, we, we see it, uh, the, the way we position ourselves conceptually uh, here, we're, we're using the International Association of Public Participation spectrum uh, of uh, participation, which defines kind of different uh, types of relationships that exist between the uh, between citizens and the state, but also the extent to which um, citizens do actually have a degree of power uh, and influence in changing decision making. Uh, so. Um, Community engagement also has been um, encouraged uh, in the process of regeneration uh, in uh, in the last 10, 20 years um, uh, as a way of bringing new perspectives uh, into uh, into decision making, um, into better understanding local needs and uh, and problems, and uh, putting forward solutions and uh, and alternatives for. Uh, for, for these problems uh, by using the local knowledge, because ultimately citizens are experts in their own area, in the way they navigate the built environment, in, in the way they um, they use um, and live in, in their neighbourhoods. Um, Nabatki also talks about these participation infrastructures um, as being the laws, the processes, institutions, and associations that support regular opportunities for people to connect, um, solve problems, and make decisions. Um, and and I suppose, you know, we we in in this project we're focusing on a particular um, aspect of this ecosystem, um, and we're focusing on local authorities um, and or, or the local state, if you want, the presence of the local state. Uh, because and investigate the role local authorities and other local state institutions have in bringing people um, people together. Um, so um, our research questions, um, because we were sort of transitioning from from a knowledge exchange program to a research uh, project, um, we looked at how the aspirations of the London Recovery Plan around community engagement are implemented and translated in local context. We're interested in the barriers um, and enablers uh, to effective and meaningful engagement um, and to what we can uh, map out as being sort of the basic infrastructure of a sustainable uh, and meaningful relationship between the local state and the public. Um, the approach that we took was to work in depth, um, you know, the deep dive approach. We worked with three um, sites, uh, two local authorities and one um, major regeneration site in East London. Um, we 
we wanted to um, actually work in collaboration with uh, with these organizations. So we adopted a co-design approach and we tried to focus and refocus our uh, main research questions so that um, you know it, we can address the concerns of the partners uh, and um, and that we used uh, uh, mixed qualitative uh, methodology. Um, we started with uh, strategic mapping and analysis of policy documents of um, of strategies and sort of aspirations in terms of uh, community engagement. Uh, we then conducted uh, interviews um, with strategic actors within these organisations. Um, and you know, by by doing these two things at the beginning, we we have first uh, an institutional narrative, a collective narrative around the role of community engagement, um, but also uh, individual narratives from from these institutional actors. And we do believe, I think, one of the one of the things that we uh, assume here is that um, uh, these internal narratives do actually shape collective action. Um, and we actually saw this in practice, in, in, in action, when we conducted deliberative workshops with, uh, with one of the organisations and we saw how collectively then um, the individuals working in those organisations were trying to, to make common sense and develop a core and, and common understanding of the value of community engagement, what works and what doesn't work, what hinders uh, meaningful and uh, effective uh, engagement with uh, with communities. Um, I will hand over to Ricardo to actually go through um, uh, some of the findings because he's been instrumental in uh, in doing some of this analysis. Ricardo, over to you. Thank you, Diana. Um, so I will be presenting now um, overall themes of the barriers and enables of community engagement that we find is not pretend to be completely extensive, but are uh, the most prominent significant one that we find on the data. Um, just a little bit of a disclaimer, because of, of ethical considerations, we're not going to talk about names or we're not going to put any quotes on it um, because we're just a bit constrained on, on that side. Um, and then in the end, we're going to look at some meta ideas that are the building blocks of this idea of the um, infrastructures of collective reimagination. What does that mean in reality? Um, so we start, oh, first of all, we start with um, the analysis revealed that um, there's general consensus that about the importance of rebuilding trust and having a positive relationship with residents. Um, although there are different interpretations and positions regarding um, ideas such as the purpose and the meaning of community engagement and what's the value within the local authority strategy or even what truly is to really co-produce and co-design with the community. Um, and this difference is felt across all levels of the organization and it's a result of a lack of uh, political accountability. Um, this obviously leads to services to being fragmented and to have dif differences between the application and the dissemination of the engagement principles, which in itself was going to lead to uh, an unregulated engagement activities. Um, the second um, theme relates um, to the to operating community engagement. Um, so our process level, uh, most participants know that time constraints and cost of engagement are really um, uh, barriers to uh, within the recovery plan. Because um, it hinders the capacity to actually do meaningful engagements, which kind of leads to um, consultations to be completely extractive and transactional and not really meaningful to the um, residents. One uh, really important partner to the local authorities are the uh, voluntary and community or, um, organizations. They're really important in terms of community engagement to um, reach or sell them um, herd groups but they can uh, act as a gatekeeper. So it cuts the direct link between the local authority. And, and the residents, which uh, leads to a lack of uh, trust and ownership of the um, uh, relationship between the local authority and, and the uh, community. So obviously resulting from the previous theme as well, we have um, that the service team lacking the expertise and the skills alongside like a poor, a poor dissemination of engagement methodologies is gonna result in the battle of design engagement. Um, the last barrier that we see um, that is really meaningful um, are the perceived external barriers and especially what is the motivation and the capacity of, of residents to engage? Um, most examples on the data reveal that not every person, for example, in the borough might be able to attend a three hour consultation on a rainy Thursday at 7 p.m. on the community hall. Um, or most residents might not be even interested in the um, themes there's going to be talking in the consultation, so they decide not to engage. And so how do we maintain 
uh, uh, the community engage within all the, the consultation process to um, and not lose um, residents. So it's about this balance between the expectations of the of the consultation in, in itself, the strategy, what the strategy really is, and then what the community influence in it. Um, going out to the um, enablers of community engagement, they somewhat respond to these barriers um, almost directly. We first see that the political leaders are called to actually own and to be responsible for direct community engagement um, and to be brave to embed consistent and defined bottom-up uh, bottom approaches to co-production and co-design. So obviously this is going to promote collaboration and alignment across services across the um, local authority. It's going to result in more like consistent and balanced initiatives. Um, also as processes and solutions start to be more inclusive and meaningful, um, there's a shift into using pre-engagement um, consultations. So engagement that happens before the sign off of strategies. Um, obviously, this allows for a full understanding of the view environment, of the built environment, the relationship needed to be had with the residents, and then the range of possible outcomes of the strategy. Um, this is beneficial to all actors involved in the recovery process um, due to community wealth building, which is normally profit based, shifts and transforms into purpose driven investments. So it's in, it embeds social value and well being at the center um, of the strategy. And with it, we move to the second barrier. So um, the community voice uh, being front and center of the strategic plan is going to lead to better engagement practices. So knowing the community wants and needs, the relationship to the built environment and the local authority. So building and owning this relationship also means the use of mixed methods and multi-channel communication streams with the community aiming to reach to a broader spectrum of the population. So, and this means being inclusive, um, being diverse and be accessible. And by this uh, digital streams, hybrid methods of consultation, um, communication in different languages, people don't have uh, a level of, in, of, of English that they're able to communicate themselves completely, um, and even accessible language, for example, for people do, um, having an intellectual disability, for example. And then the last um, barrier that we find um, is within the organization. So um, having a team that is knowledgeable, knowledgeable and that reflects the diversity within the community, um, approximates the local authority to the residents. And this um, is really meaningful when we look at consultation because the officer or the person that is representing local authority is not, is creating a relationship with the community themselves and the local authority being representative of the local authority. And that um, really brings meaningfulness to the consultation. Um, and obviously skill development cannot be just, um, cannot be retained at a leadership level, but it needs to be perpetuated to the frontline um, um, officers to create more complete engagement initiatives. So, for example, if someone wants to design initiatives, they are poverty and trauma informed, for example. Um, so, this knowledge management and dissemination does have to be an organizational commitment, which ensures you know best practice and ways of working modules. Um, lastly, this will be almost like the building blocks of this concept of infrastructures of collective reimagination. So, when we look at value. We ask our local authorities incorporating community voice as an added value, so as a statutory requirement, a tick in a box per se, or are we looking at it as an embedded value, so a strategic commitment, um, the uh, social value being front and center of the strategy, the trust, what relationship is needed to gain and rebuild the trust, and then how we maintain it, um, the infrastructures, so how we acknowledge the existing infrastructures, this being social physical, psychological, and how we incorporate that within the recovery plans, but then without losing the social cohesion. Um, uncertainty and titration, so to what extent is the local authority organizationally mature to review processes and to change course of action if needed uh, by accepting that processes are not always right and allowing space and time for to, to change the course of action if needed. Um, and I think the most important one in the end will be the legacy and the permanence of this structure. So how to ensure that recovery plans um, and strategies redefine what success, prosperity and purpose mean, and then to be able to sustain uh, co-design and co-production on the long term and not just something on the, on the, um, something immediate. Um, and then back to you, Diana. Yeah, thank you, um, Ricardo. And I think, you know, I'm going to, Try to conclude very, very uh, briefly here, because I think what we're talking about, and I want to try to link in with some of the other presentations. Um, I think what we're talking about here is that what we see is really, um, you know, some epistemic shift um, at the level of uh, the local authorities and, and kind of other state actors 
in terms of recognizing them you know weekly wicked and complex challenges actually do need local involvement uh, and meaningful inf involvement with communities um we we do see the local de democracy in a state of flux um uh, and that multiple tensions and multiple pressure points uh, for for this to happen um but but what what we what we do see is that although there is a lot of uh, sort of innovation in participatory governance um, uh, at the fringes of the formal frameworks uh, of, of governance, and I think, you know, the other projects sort of touched upon on uh, those kind of participatory, uh, participatory placemaking, for instance, and kind of the, the really, really great work that some of the um, some of the um, engagement and participatory uh, participation entrepreneurs um, really put forward there. Um, I think our question is to what extent um, do these uh, participatory innovations fit in within existing uh, frameworks of, of governance? And I think one of the issues is how do we address this issue of the jagged edges uh, and the tensions in participatory governance? Um, such as legitimation, accountability, inclusivity, and, and empowerment. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, we have to, to mention here is the visionaries uh, in local authorities. Although innovations and practice in participatory governance within these organizations uh, are quite fragmentally, uh, fra fragmented and not uniformly understood and applied in local context, we do, uh, we did encounter these uh, visionaries, you know, people in leadership positions um, that uh, are actually not afraid of owning the relationship between residents and the local authority. They're not commissioning it to 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 outside organisations, uh, and I think that's that's quite uh, important. But in order to address that issue of the jagged edges, uh, as we call it, and make participatory democracy dock in, um, in in the current frameworks of, of local governance, I think uh, there needs to be all these changes that we see and the dynamics that we see um, of societal change need them to be reflected across the whole uh, into the participatory infrastructures. And here we mean all those institutions, um, uh, sort of the, the kind of the laws, the processes, but also uh, the culture and the mentality within uh, those institutions. So I'm going to stop here because I know we don't want to run out of time of actually discussing and talking about these uh, topics. But thank you very much for, for this and looking forward to questions. Thanks a lot, Diana and Ricardo. That was a great actually roundup. It's a good concluding presentation, I think, because it seems to uh, include quite a lot of the comments that have already come up in relation to community engagement, participatory um, processes, and some of the some of the difficult issues like trust. The word trust, of course, is going to come up in this discourse. Uh, but I also thought um, interesting, Diana, that especially the slides on the barriers and enablers for community engagement really reflected a lot of the conversation that we had with all the local authorities during the social integration and regeneration learning network and looking at very specific case studies about ways in which um, those barriers can be overcome, which they can be overcome, but being able to document them in that way and reflect them back, I think, is really useful because it's it's clearly not easy and local authorities are under a lot of financial pressure that needs to be stated as well. So all quite difficult. And that was really useful kind of thinking around ways in which that can can work. Um, so we're, we're opening up the floor now for questions. We, we have a few questions, but I wonder if anybody wants to come in and make comments and questions already. If you could put your hand up, that would be really useful so we could see. Um, so does anybody already want to jump in and make a, a, a reflection about what we've heard um, in this evening so far? OK, so maybe whilst people are thinking and of questions or maybe putting them in the chat, I, I've got I've got a few that I, I think would be quite useful. I'm going to come back to James first of all. James is still with us. Yeah, he is. Um, James, glad you're still with us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask James, having opened this and given us the GLA kind of big picture and listened to these different approaches, different tools, different uh, cases, um, how do you see this sort of being fitting into the mayor's agenda on social integration? What's the, what's the learning for you and how do we sort of embed some of this learning into uh, re regeneration discussions and, and discussions of the work that you're doing across London? 
I can I can certainly try and answer. I mean, I mean, I think the mayor has been really kind of committed to this agenda, and and that's partly why we were able to do some of this work and and get some of you involved in this and start to start to think about it. I think I think the real power for us has been um, to kind of explore this with the people on the ground that are, that are kind of doing some of the the kind of really local. Um, regeneration type work and, and local authorities that are already part of that picture but I think it's been mentioned a few times already just how we kind of reset the relationship with community um, and I think you know I've worked in regeneration for quite a while I think um, you know we've got a lot of issues around um, trust and whether or not we're working in the interests of communities or whether we're working in you know other other interests um, you could say the economy um, and I think that's been a really difficult one uh, and it's a difficult one for, for the mayor to solve. It's quite a difficult one for uh, even people like me to solve. And I think all of this work has uh, contributed to trying to explore that um, conversation and how we might genuinely um, move to a different kind of way of involving people in the decisions that affect them. Um, and, I, you know, we, we don't get this right. We have we have come a, a serious amount of, of of the way in the last 15 years, I would say, when I kind of started looking at some of this stuff, it really wasn't even on, on the agenda of, of a lot of developers, a lot of um, people involved in planning and regeneration processes. And I think it is now. That doesn't mean it's done very well um, and it doesn't mean it's done consistently and it doesn't mean that it actually, you know, translates to, to you know, on the ground in a, in a way that people feel that they are being listened to and that they are part of, of the process and that they are having an impact and um, and that's the biggest kind of challenge going forward I think you know it's on it's on the radar now of decision makers and those with the power so how do we kind of make it work how do we kind of embed it into the conversations that we are having around um, EDI and around social value and around thinking beyond just the kind of you know triple bottom line when you when you make investments in places um so how do we kind of take the, the work that you're doing and make it um kind of digestible and, and mainstream that type of practice in a consistent way that people can kind of believe in uh time and time again and i think if you do it you know really inconsistently um we st we kind of continue the problem you know what what is it that people can expect from an organization like the gla or a local authority and how do we kind of hold uh, those processes to account? I don't know if that kind of answers the question. I hope that's kind of where we are going, but I appreciate it's still a bit of a leap um, to do to do you know this good work at scale. Yeah, thanks, James. I think it is, and I think you're. Uh, it seems to me, um, you know, things like the regeneration network, where you you keep that conversation going, you keep uh, talking to people who are doing. And one thing that came out of that was how time. There's a lot of time pressure on local authority staff to get things done and developments and it, inevitably the community engagement takes it slows things down and makes things more complicated and so there's a, an inherent tension there in trying to do it but talking to each other and sharing these cases and also think the like partnerships between London Met and local authorities and the GLA and the community sector exactly what we've been hearing about that's got to be part of the solution that we keep we keep having these partnership um, research projects pilots conversations to keep it to keep it moving so um, thanks for that. I'm going to ask um, Louise a question now about about the the, the your, your your piece, Louise. What, what what I mean in a way, it's as a policy as a policy um, follow on from that. The work that you're doing. I mean, do you, what what do you see? Are the how do we improve? What are the, what, how can we improve housing and services, transport for this particular? You know, how do we feed what you've been you've heard and you've presented so beautifully to the people who are designing? infrastructure, tra public transport, uh, in particular housing, a lot of it related to in inaccessible housing, which which was, you know, people were getting stuck in. So do you have any, uh, are you planning to do anything with that? Or do you see how that could, could sort of start to play out in terms of making changes? I mean, I, I would like to just reiterate what you said earlier, Sally, about the fact that local authorities have very little money um, and less money, it seems, all the time. So I think if if I've learned anything from my years of, of trying to do stakeholder engagement and develop impact and, you know, at the university, we're all about impact. 
it's that challenge of dealing with local authorities who are often the most immediate stakeholders on the ground when they're looking at diminishing budgets. So it really is about bringing a whole load of other kinds of partners into the conversation, including um, housing associations, uh, but other providers as well. And and for me, particularly looking at the older people and having them as as key voices in that process, because as I think I tried to show in the presentation, people's needs are changing all the time. So this is a very dynamic group. And as that quote from one of the ladies saying, my eight, my 60s were great years. I had a great time in my 60s. But then as she entered her 70s and had more issues, then mobility and then subsequently housing and accessibility became a huge concern. And she ended up um, moving into uh, a housing association, which was specifically catering for the needs of older people, which addressed issues of loneliness, but also mobility and accessibility and security for her. So there clearly are solutions that can be happening at a small scale on a local level. How we scale those up in the current financial situation is a huge challenge. But I think the one thing that I would say is that we have got to have all of those local residents, including the older people. And just to emphasize that point, that an older person is not necessarily a 65 year old who's just come back from playing a round of golf and is um, raring to go for a meeting. This is the people in their 80s, the people in their early 90s who are very hard to, to engage, but who may be the people with the most acute needs as well. So when we talk about older people, then we really have to have the diversity of older people very much at the heart of that conversation. And I'd also just like to apologise if anybody was distracted by me eating my supper earlier. Um, I don't know if I, I probably didn't turn my camera off when I was because I've got to run to choir after this. So I was eating my supper very hastily. Apologies if I distracted anyone. No problems. I didn't hear it myself, but no problems. Thank you. Thank you anyway. And thank you for that really good, great response, Louise. Um, looks like we've got Robin with this. Robin, you've put your hand up. Would you like to come in and make a comment or, or ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Robin Harper. I'm at the City University of New York, and I am absolutely fascinated by your discussion. Um, and I'm curious if I could ask Louise to comment a little bit about um, how caregivers fit into the uh, your you know your story um, and the role that they play in really understanding the elderly as uh, as agents of change in place. Thank you. Thanks for joining from New York, Robin. That's great to have you on board. So, Louise, have you, what, the role of caregivers, that's a really good point. Yes, and in fact, thanks, Robin. That was one of the issues we were looking at in the project because it was called sustainable care. And it, it was also another work package, not my work package, but a parallel work package was also working with carers, specifically family carers. So and this came up in many of the interviews that we did that we were interviewing the older person but there was often perhaps a partner or a child or even a grandchild who was the carer and so including their experiences was also a key part of that story because they were the ones who were having to negotiate and support this older person on an everyday basis uh, as well as handling their own busy jobs and lives and their own children so particularly for carers who were children who also had their own younger children and then they had an older parent that they were trying to support. Uh, it was very, very challenging. So that is something that we did include in the project. And if you're interested, I could um, send a, a link to the website for the overall project where the experiences of carers, particularly family carers, was also something that was very much part of the research. So that's a, a short answer, but I can direct you to the website. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. That would be terrific. Thanks a lot, Louise and, and, and Robin. Um, any other questions, please put your hand up or put it in the chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to come to Beatrice and ask a question there. Um, what came up for me, I, I mean, that was really quite complex, your methodology and the organisations that you work with. But one of the things I was going to ask about is, uh, the, when you're working with such small community led organisations, and I'm familiar with both Brixton Project and, and um, Latin Elephant, it, 
as a way of valuing the expertise that they're bringing to to the group were they, was were they paid was there a sort of an acknowledgement of this being an um, an expertise a form of resource that that needs to be uh, you know paid for involvement in research projects and pilots like this and also what's the benefit for them will they be get to get to the way that the, the beautiful uh, mapping that you produce can they use that is that going to be useful for them in terms of their negotiations perhaps with the local authority or with planners or with their own communities so so they're getting they're getting benefit not just um contributing their their knowledge and their expertise of, of local areas yeah thank you there's uh, always one of the key questions i think in in doing collaborative work and in this case we had in each organization there were uh, researchers, like um, um, so the researchers embedded within the organization that contributed time and and uh, that was recognized within the the project's budget, so that the organization got at least covered for the time that they were putting into uh, into preparing. But at the same time, I think the uh, as you were posing the question, like the issue around benefits is further and and beyond that. And there's sort of financial recognition and, and time recognition. And I think one of the, uh, obviously, first of all, this was a very small uh, pilot project and, and something that we are hoping and we are in conversation with each other of the organizations about how it might expand and, and carry on uh, over a longer period of time. But an important aspect of, uh, of the pilot has been that we've been co-designing with them what were the key questions that they wanted to address during the workshops who were the people that they wanted to be in conversation with uh, within those those workshops and at the moment we are uh, so we are in the process of producing these initial diagrams and the idea is exactly to go back to them to discuss uh, what uh, before we finalize the project like what out of all of this information what is it that is most useful to them and and in which formats could that be uh, most useful and and yeah, this has been a really key aspect of our reflection on how uh, how the work progresses. And also, I think what they they all highlighted, and and perhaps both Alessio and, and Luis might want to jump in on this quickly. But uh, but they all highlighted the importance as well of having these moments and having someone externally coming in to facilitate a conversation and then catalyzing a conversation with, in some cases, partners or community members that they hadn't talked to in a while. This was also happening after the pandemic and so forth. So there was also value in the process that is not necessarily the output that we produce out of it is not necessarily the output that we think is most valuable, but but that happened in the in that moment. Great, right, thanks. thanks. Alessio, Alessio, did you want to come in? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to add to what the Tracy was saying, uh, yeah, first of all, this was meant to be a proper collaboration from the beginning, also from the financial side. I mean, I'll, I'll have to add in regard to that that um, some of the participants were actually quite surprised at the beginning that that element was there, we, which I found it quite interesting in telling about the well, if you want the state of this kind of research in other circumstances. Um, in, in terms of the advantages of it, uh, yes, one element was this having an opportunity to discuss things collectively. And I think it relates to what Louise was saying about the issue of, of time and the lack of time that many people working at community level often, often are, are faced with. Uh, so apart from the more kind of methodological and really kind of the benefits of the research per se. The research became an opportunity to have collective conversations in, in a setting and in a, and in a way that, that usually people wouldn't have. But another challenge which emerged and which I think is also something which happens very often when you try to do engagement and impact with, with the public sector is the staff turnover. And so I should probably mention that at least in one of the organizations we had a number of key people who were involved in the pilot stage who in the meantime have left the organization and so that presents a, a challenge for us in taking this forward in the in the longer term and and it connects to this idea of the local community and ideas of what communities are and here we're talking about infrastructures made up of organizations very often but, but clearly we are talking above all about 
networks made up of people and individuals, which beyond the formal infrastructure and beyond the logos of the organization of, of all that are very often the crucial nodes of the network. And when those people move on, as they often as they often do, uh, that creates challenges, well, not just for us doing our research, but for how local networks uh, operate. So that, that's probably another another dimension that, that emerged from our from our pilot and we'll need to look into as we move move forward. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Alessia. And I think I, I really um, concur with you about the uh, one of your you know added value of this kind of thing is the, is offering facilitated and structured conversations between community organizations and perhaps some of the partners that they want to have a conversation with but find it quite difficult to manage that conversation or even convene people to have that conversation so those are all really useful um useful uh, results of your your pilot so uh, Diana I'm going to come to you and, and Ricardo and perhaps I'll ask you a question and maybe ask you to sort of wrap up a little bit as well in terms of the the session today I think um for me one of the questions which has come up a lot is obviously about trust so and, and you had it in your diagram <laughs> you know that the so what, what what have you what are you, what do you think you've learned in in the in the research that you've done about how to build trust what what elements build trust because it's clearly a, a big problem with a lot of the communities that we're we're working with and, and in social integration generally so what, what what do you see as being some of the key ways and in a way it's some of those enablers but what how how is trust built or, or regained with communities um that you, you've seen with local authorities in particular um yeah i think it's a million dollar question isn't it um trust came up as you know one of the main main themes in terms of barriers um, um i think there's there's something there about the way we do community engagement um, and i remember there's uh, one of the participants in, in one of the organizations uh, mentioned that you know uh, the way we do engagement is almost as important as important as doing engagement in the first place um, and you know, linked to to this, actually, we're we're gonna continue with a uh, with a piece of work, uh, a new ish project, uh, where we demonstrate. Um, well, we try to investigate the extent to which um, uh, community engagement done badly can actually lead to uh, value destruction rather than value creation in the public sector. So I think you know we need to be very very careful about the extent to which. Um, uh, these engagement mechanisms and, 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 and practices uh, become too extractive, become a tick box process and so on and so forth. Um, you know, some of the other things that we've learned was that you need to invest in actually managing expectations as well, uh, because, um, you know, a lot of the in, in some of the re regeneration projects, you may go in with very good intentions and allow people to um, to express their opinions and tell you how they want to see this place transformed uh, and what they want the area to look like um, uh, without actually telling them what's in your powers to do at the end of the day. So that's that, there, was, there was a very key issue there around managing expectations. And although I think, you know, having the conversations, I think setting the frame for in which those conversations are taking place are really important because then you are going to come up against kind of really disillusioned uh, residents. Uh, you know, in the next meeting, they'll be uh, saying, well, you know, you said you're going to do this or we said we wanted this to happen and actually you didn't do it. Um, um, and, you know, this has really big ramifications in terms of public education, for instance, really understanding the process uh, of the decision making in the in in uh, at the local level. Um, and I suppose the, the other uh, the other aspect that I would uh, say is the um, owning the relationship. Uh, I mean, we've seen uh, in the social integration learning network, for instance, in our work, we've seen that there's a it's quite a wide variety of uh, approaches that local authorities take in terms of uh, how they engage with residents. And I think for for in some instances you know the default position is that they're going to commission a uh, either a voluntary sector organization a think tank or as we call them a, a participation entrepreneur to actually uh, conduct that piece of engagement with uh, with residents and whilst there's advantages to to doing that there's also some really some downsizes because 
um, as we've heard from some of the more kind of visionaries, uh, visionary participants um, and members of, of the organizations that we've spoken to, that can have like a negative back on effect uh, because that relationship with residents needs to be uh, needs, needs to be owned. Um, local authorities shouldn't be afraid of going to their residents and having these difficult conversations with with them. And that's one of the way you kind of build trust. You know, having the courage to actually go out there and and really engage with um, with them. I don't know if Ricardo wants to, to to add anything, but those are my my sort of few thoughts on on that question. Um, yeah, just I think just two little quick points that can come up on my mind. It's um, understanding the history there of consultation that, that has been happening as well. So many communities might be uh, fatigued in terms of consultations they've been having, especially when we're talking about a dichotomy of old residents and new residents. New residents might see that as perfect, beautiful, we're going to be consulted, that's great. But all the residents might seem, oh no, it's just another consultation, we're not going to go there. So it's understanding that uh, a relationship from years behind. Um, and then one thing that um, come up that links with what you're saying there, Anna, it's not expecting the community to come to the council or to the local authority, but local authority to come to the community. So it's that action of, we're actually going to engage with the community. We're going to go to the places where they, they are. One, um, one local authority wanted to do a piece with uh, young people. So instead of just sending a survey on social media, they went to the place where they were, for example, McDonald's, which is mm -hmm. great. You know, they went there and interviewed <laughs> young people at McDonald's. So it's it's that kind of action, it's that kind of purpose and meaning behind what you're doing that's going to make the trust build. Obviously, it's a slow process. It's a process that, you know, takes time. But that's why we're talking about this uncertainty and changing action if needed and reviewing and feedbacking and, and continuing and allowing that space. Um, but I think it's not expecting the community to come to local authority, but the local authority actually take a step to yeah. actually go there and show their face to the community. Yeah, yeah. And if I if I may add just, just a couple of more points, uh, and maybe as a way of uh, wrapping this up, um, I wanted to, to turn back to what Beatrice was saying about the importance of having these sort of, you know, facilitated and structured conversations. And we also found this in, in our project um, and the local authorities that we worked with uh, really appreciated the fact that, you know, there was an external and sort of like a fresh pair of eyes looking at, for instance, their community engagement strategies and you know their, their their community engagement initiatives and um and also kind of being there kind of analyzing the way they speak about community engagement the way that you know the value they attach to 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 these concepts the kind of meanings and how and appreciated actually the in, in our deliberative workshops the fact that they had this that space to um to deliberate and, and actually build some sort of common language and common understanding because I think this is something that's quite lacking I think we you know we we did kind of a strategy policy mapping around community engagement and we see all sorts of uh, interchangeable terms from sort of engagement to you know co-production co-design and um and 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 then if you kind of refer back to to the more th kind of theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks we, we then ask, you know, like, actually, what do these mean in practice? And is this co-production, is this co-design really? Um, and I think there's a danger there, you know, when I was talking about that value destruction and potential for, for value destruction, there's a, you know, there's a danger there that if we if we misuse um, these terms and over-promise and not manage expectations, then that will lead to, to value destruction. And the other point, um, kind of linking to to Louise's work, um, I think you know we shouldn't underestimate the sheer challenge actually that local authorities and state institutions face when when talking about shifting the dial from from a top down sort of decision making approach to a more uh, bottom up participatory uh, governance. Um, you know, and what comes to mind is. Is this idea that in, in a lot of the um, in a lot of the analysis that we see around diversity and inclusivity of community engagement, we see these kind of mis or this kind of negative perceptions of the older resident that has time to come to the to the to the meetings and come to the consultations and and actually I think we should be really really careful when we do that because you know first of all as Louise was saying we shouldn't put kind of 
all the residents all in one um, in one basket. Um, and 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 secondly, um, you know there is a challenge within that particular group to actually have diverse voices, and we shouldn't uh, yeah we, we we shouldn't kind of skew our conversations when when we talk about these. Um, and whilst you know in, in our project we talked about one part of the ecosystem, which is the local authorities, um, and we've seen sort of uh, uh, Beatrice talking more about the other part of the ecosystem, the community organisations, and I suppose from, from Louise's perspective, we have the, the perspective of residents. I think this this kind of perception, this, this kind of uh, three-dimensional um, perspective can really help policymakers to actually understand uh, better um, you know, what sort of barriers there might be there in, in really embedding um, uh, social integration principles within some of this work around area transformation, around uh, uh, around planning and, and regeneration. Great. Thanks. That really, that's a really good sum up, I think, as well, Diana. So I'm just going to say, I think there's no more questions or, or comments in the chat. So, and we've been online for two hours, a really, really interesting exchange for two hours. So I'd like just to say thank you to all the speakers and people staying on board. It's been really very rich. I think it'd be really interesting to see what we where we go next with this, to continue to have that conversation, to hear about how the pilot goes for Beatrice. And it's not that's work in progress. I'd love to hear what happens next. But anyway, Diana, I'm going to maybe hand back to you to just wrap up because I know you're the, the person who who uh, launched this particular forum and discussion. Uh, now, thank you very much to, to everyone. You're on mute, Deanna. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to thank everyone. And, um, you know, it was really good that we could bring together these different strands of work in, in the university that have a lot of synergies and and actually have, uh, you know, the external speakers, um, you know, James and, and, and Nicola, um, actually be part of this because uh, I think in, in London Met, we're quite focused on sort of working in partnership with with um, uh, with uh, local authorities in London. Um, and we do, you know, we, we do want to inform um, uh, policymakers, but also we want to uh, start new projects that are actually fitting in with um, with with the kind of the bigger agendas and the bigger questions and concerns that either the GLA or local authorities uh, might have. So um, I, I really appreciate you all being here and thank you very much, Sally, for uh, really, really skillful uh, moderation of, of this discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Good night. Have a good evening, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.